As we begin our study in the first epistle of John, there's one thing we must recognize, and that is that this epistle is addressed to believers, to the brethren. Now, to fail to recognize that will cause serious mistakes going through the epistle. Now, it is a very short five-chapter epistle and rather simple. Now, in this first session, we will cover chapter 1 and the first 11 verses of chapter 2. Now, as we begin in uh, chapter 1, here John says to the believers, that which was from the beginning. Now, notice the word the is in italics. He says, that which was from beginning, that is, before the beginning of all things, because Christ was the one who did the creative work we see in many portions of the Word of God. Now, that which was from beginning, uh, which we heard, and uh, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon, have looked upon, or literally which we looked upon, and our hands have handled, our hands handled, uh, of or concerning the word of the life. Now, the word of is concerning, concerning the word of the life. Now, the article the precedes the word life here, and that's on about the life that is uh, in God, that is that eternal life. And then notice the parenthetical statement here in verse 3. Uh, the word for, as he says, and... It is the word kaya. Uh, so it is, and the life was manifested. That is, it was made open and revealed to us. And we've seen it. Uh, it was manifested, made open, shown, and we saw it. And we bear witness, or we bear testimony. And that is a bear testimony is one word, and it's a present tense verb, which means we bear testimony to this. We continue to bear testimony to this fact. And we show, or we announce, we declare, we make known to you that, or literally, the eternal life. The life which is the eternal. Now, the only life that is eternal is God's life. And eternal is that which has no beginning and no ending. Now, we all have everlasting life. Life is a li Everlasting life is life which had a beginning, but no ending. You exists somewhere, either in heaven or hell, after this life is over. Now, when we receive, therefore, eternal life, as I've explained on many occasions, that uh, we receive the life of God, the very God, into our person in the new birth of the regeneration as the Spirit of God comes into us. So we have the life of God, which is eternal. We don't have to wait till we die and go to eternal life. We have it. Our salvation in our eternal life is not a doctrine, it's not a practice, it's not a position, it is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. So he says, we show, announce, or declare to you that e that life which is the eternal, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto or to us. Now this life was with the Father, and it's now manifested to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, notice the conclusion now of that parenthetical statement. That which we have seen and heard declare or announce or make known to you. Now, we saw it. Our hands handled it. We've seen that eternal life who was Christ, that was God manifest in the flesh. And that's the one we're declaring to you. Why? That ye. Now, the word ye is in the emphatic position here. He's saying that you also may have and may continue to have. Now that is a present tense verb, may have, and therefore it is a continuous tense from the Greek standpoint, that you may have and you may continue to have fellowship with us. Now the word fellowship is a word that carries the concept of a joint participation in a common interest and activity. So he said that you may have a joint participation with us. You might jointly participate with us and truly our fellowship or our joint participation is with the Father and with the Son of Him, Jesus Christ. His Son, or literally the Son of Him, Jesus Christ. So we have fellowship with Him and we want you to have, continue to have that as well, he says. And these things write we unto you. That is, what things? Just about Christ? No, it's the things of this entire epistle. The things I'm writing to you now in this epistle 
we write unto you that your joy may be full. Now, your joy, the joy of you, are literally the joy of us. Ours as well as yours. We all may have joy together as we have this joint participation together of fellowship in Christ, that it may be full. May be is a present tense verb. May be and may continue to be, having been and continuing to be full. The word full is a perfect participle, having been and continuing to be. So we can have a constant joy in Christ if we have our unity with him. Now, by unity, I do not mean just being saved and having Christ in us, but having our lives yielded unto him and to the teachings of his word. So he says, this then is the message which we have heard. This is the message we heard of or from him. And this is the message we declare and continue to declare and now it's make known to you. What is it? That God is light. The God, the Godhead is light. And in him is no darkness at all. There is no darkness in him. It is all light. It is all understanding. Now he goes on to say, therefore, if, and this word if is a third class conditional clause, and uh, it is coupled with the subjunctive mode. Now, if, third class clause is if, the way we use the word most of the time today, there's four classes of conditional clauses in the Greek language. First class says if, as indeed it is, it has been established to be a fact. Same thing as we say since today. Uh, a second class clause is if, as indeed it is not. It has been established not to be a fact. Third class clause is if, it's possible, we don't know which way it's going to go. That's the way we use if most of the time. Fourth class is if it's possible, but not very likely at all. So now, in Greek grammar, when you couple a third class clause with a subjunctive mode, which is the mode of doubtful statement, hesitating affir affirmation, conditional chance, then what we have grammatically is a supposition. So he says, suppose now we say, that is, we as the children of God, that we have and continue to have fellowship or joint participation with him. Now, suppose we should say that and make that claim, that we're constantly having joint participation with him. And while we say that, we are walking. We walk, or we continue to walk. That word walk is a present tense verb, which means we order our behavior and continue to order our behavior in the darkness, not in the light of Christ and of God's word, but we order our behavior in the darkness away from it while claiming to constantly have fellowship with him. What's the problem? We lie and do not the truth. Now that does not mean that one is not saved. He's saying a brother in Christ here. That we lie and do not the truth. Because if one claims to be in joint fellowship and participation with Christ constantly, and yet he's constantly walking in the ways of darkness and living his life in the order of the ways of the world, then he's lying about it and he's not, he's not speaking truth about matters. But if, again, third class, we don't know which way to go, if we should order our behavior and continue to order our behavior, walk, again, is a present tense verb. If we walk or order our behavior in the light as he is in the light, now, if we order our behavior in the light of the truth of God according to the word of God, then we have joint participation, not only with him, but one with another. As believers, we have that joint participation. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us, continues to cleanse us, another present tense verb here. So it cleanses and continues to cleanse us from all sin, or literally from every sin. The word all and the word sin are both uh, singular words. So he cleanses us and continues to cleanse us from every sin. It's a constant, continuous thing that is taking place if we order our behavior in him, in the light, in the way that he would have us to go. Because he, say, he says that if we order our behavior in the light as he is in the light, then we have joint participation not only with one another, but the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continues constantly, unceasingly cleanses us from every sin, keeps us clean constantly. That is, by ordering our behavior 
in the light of Christ. Now, uh, if, again, a third class clause, suppose now, we don't know which way you're going to do, we say, suppose one should say at any point in time, that we have no sin, or we have not sinned at all. We don't have any sin. Then we deceive ourselves. Now, we all have some sin because he continues cleansing us from every sin as we order our behavior according to his word, but none of us are absolutely perfect. Some walk a better life than others. Some live closer to the Lord than others. But if we are doing our best and endeavoring to live according to the teaching of the word of God, which I am convinced that most saved people do not do, uh, they live a basic respectable life, but they do not get into the Word. They don't even know what the Word teaches about most matters. And so, therefore, they cannot order their behavior in it if they do not know what it is. So, uh, if we say that we don't have any sin, that we're, we're not doing anything wrong, we deceive ourselves. It's a self-deception. And the truth is not in us. The truth of God, because we know that we're all sinners by nature and none of us are perfect. Now, he says, I want you to be holy in all manner of conduct or conversation in the book of Peter because our God is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or conduct or behavior. Now, God doesn't command the impossible. We cannot be holy because holy means totally apart from sin. We cannot be apart from sin, but we can be holy in our conduct. I may not be able to prevent unholy thoughts running through my mind, that's sin, but I can prevent acting them out and carrying them out in my outward life and behavior. So we can be holy in our behavior while God is total, totally holy in character and being. Now if, a third class clause again, we don't know which way we're due, if we confess and continue to confess the sins, the fact that we are sinful, then he is faithful and he is just, or he is righteous, to forgive. Uh, he is righteous to forgive at that point in time us the sins, and to cleanse us from all or from every unrighteousness. The word all and the word unrighteousness both are singular words. So, he will cleanse us from every unrighteousness. But if, third class again, uh, if we say that we have not sinned, we have not sinned at all, then we make and continue to make him a liar. We say we've never sinned. We don't, we don't sin at all. Then we make God a liar. And yet there's people today who claim that they live perfection apart from sin. And if you sin, you lose your salvation and you've got to get saved again and so forth. But yet he says here, if we make him a liar if we say we haven't sinned. And his word, or the word of him, is not in us. We do not have the truth of the word of God within us, if that's what we claim in our life. Now notice, he says, what I'm making known to you is what we've seen and heard and know and handled, that is, of the word of life, who is the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we can have fellowship with him in one with another, and it is if we order our behavior according to the light of his word with proper understanding. Then he goes on to say, my little children or my dear children. Now again, remember, we must recognize that all of this is addressed to the believer and had nothing to do with the unsaved in these matters. My dear children, these things I write unto you. All of these things I'm writing in this epistle, I've written to you as dear children, as saved ones. Why? That ye sin not. I'm trying to help you not to sin. If you will walk in the light of the word, then you won't be sinning as much. Uh, that ye sin not. And he says, if any man sin. But if you do sin anyway, he says, I want you to know something. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous of the righteous one. Now notice that word advocate. That word advocate is the word paraclete that you've probably heard about at various times. He is our, uh, our advocate, our paraclete, the one that goes along beside the help. He's our attorney before the Father. Uh, he is the advocate with the Father. And who is that? Jesus Christ, the righteous one. 
Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is our advocate. He is the one that goes before the Father as our paraclete, the one that helps us, the one who is our attorney and pleads our case before the Father. And he, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now let's go back and analyze what he said here. He is the propitiation, the helasmos. The Greek word is helasmos. He is the one who makes amends. The word propitiation means one that makes amends, or the one who completely appeases the justice, the anger and wrath of God towards sin. Uh, he satisfies God's justice. So he's the one that makes amends. You see, if I do something to offend you, I need to do something to make up to you. Now, we have all sinned and offended God, but we're not capable of making up to him. We have no means of making up to him. We just cannot do it. But Jesus Christ did it on our behalf. He is the one that makes amends for our uh, concerning our sins. The word for is not gar, it's peri. He makes those amends concerning our sins or the sins of us, but not just for us as believers only, but also the whole world. Notice, notice the words of the sins of in italics, the concept is there and they're properly placed because that's what he's talking about. Not only our sins, but of the whole world, that is the sins of the whole world. So Christ made amends unto God for the sins of the whole world. Now, so far as God is concerned, amends have been made for all humanity on a part of every human being from Adam till the end of time. Does that mean that all of them are saved? No. You see, he made amends and we must accept the fact. God has accepted it and all that's left is for us to accept it or believe it. As the Apostle Paul said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And we have this over and over in the Gospel of John and many other places that it's by God's grace provided for us, but it's through our faith that we accept it or receive it. So, but this amends was made for our sins and for all the whole world. But the people must accept it before it becomes uh, effective for them. Now, he says, I'm writing to you to help you not to sin so much as believers. And uh, I want you to know, though, that if you do sin, we have an advocate uh, uh, with the Father. Uh, we have a, one that is our helper with the Father, who is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And this Jesus Christ is the one that makes amends for all sins we may commit as believers, but not only for us only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby, or herein, herein we do know and we continue to know. Again, a present tense verb. We do know is one word. So herein we know and continue to know uh, that we know him. Here's how we continue to know that we really know him if we keep and continue to keep his commandments or the commandments or the teachings of him. And the only way to know the commandments and the teachings of the Word of God is to intently study it. We need to be in the Word of God. Just going to church and hearing the sermons one, two, or three times a week is not enough. You get a lot of instruction there, but you need to be in the Word of God, analyzing it, reading it, studying it yourself. And that is the responsibility of every child of God. Every person is personally accountable unto God for their understanding of things. What I may teach you, uh, you should not accept anything that I teach or that any other preacher or teacher teaches or makes known unless you can see it to be true from the Word of God. And once what you see is to be true, you are to make it a part of your very life. So he says, uh, in this we know that we know him. How? If we keep his commandments and teachings. If we are observing and living by them. You see, if we are doing those things, then we really know him, and you can't know him and his ways unless you know his words. Now, he that saith, or a present participle, he that is saying, I know him, a person that says, I know him, and keeping not 
another present participle, and keeping not his commandments or teachings, is a liar. Now that doesn't mean he's not a saved person, because a lot of saved people say, I know Christ and I'm, I'm a Christian and they may be saved and no question about it. But if they're not keeping his teachings and following his words, then they don't really know him. They know him in salvation. They have that personal relationship with him, but they don't really know him and his ways because if they did, they would be living by them. So he says he is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, the truth of the Word of God is the way in which we know Him, and if we know that truth of God and put it to work in our life, then we are knowing Him and we have the confidence that we know Him. But, whoso keepeth uh, and continues to keep His Word, now notice here, whoso keepeth, that is a present tense verb, he that is keeping and continuing to keep. He who has uh, and continues to have the word of him, in him verily or truly is the love of God perfected or li literally completed. We are none perfect in our love for God, but it can be completed in us to a point of maturity. So the person that is keeping the word of him, in that person truly is the love of God completed. And hereby, or herein, know we that we are in Him. Now, in keeping His Word, we know that we're in Him, and we know Him well, because we know His Word, and we live according to His Word, and we're knowing how He would have us to live, and we're doing so. That is really knowing Him. Now, he that saith, uh, he abideth in him. Now, he abideth is one word, and it's a present infinitive. He that is claiming to, to, to abide in him. Oh, I, I'm abiding in Christ. I'm staying right in him. I'm abiding in him. Uh, he ought himself also so to walk or order his behavior, even as he walk. And word he is emphatic, referring to the person of Christ. So then, this confirms what we just said up above, that this is directed at the believer. Uh, we know that we're in him because he that's, that is saying, that is claiming to abide in him, then ought also himself to order his behavior as Christ walked. So he's saying here that as a child of God, we ought to be ordering our behavior according to the teaching of the word of God. And if we do, we are abiding in him, we are keeping his words, and therefore we have the total confidence that we know him. But people who claim to be abiding in him, uh, who claim to have this knowledge, but not living according to the word of God, they're lying and not telling the truth at all, because although they might be saved, they are not abiding or dwelling in Christ and ordering their behavior according to his word. So he says, brethren, now notice again, all of this is directed to the brethren. Uh, he says, my dear children, and now he says brethren, and so he's talking to the saved ones. I write no new commandment to you. I write not a new commandment to you. I'm not giving you a new commandment, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. An old commandment which you had from the beginning, and what is that? way back in the book of Leviticus and quoted in the New Testament over and over and over again more than anything else and as stated as the royal law of scripture thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The word love is agape which means to highly value. Thou shalt highly value thy neighbor. Now the neighbor doesn't mean people who live close to you next door. But Christ was asked that question when he was asked, but who is my neighbor? And he told the story of the good Samaritan. And so he's saying, your neighbor is anyone you happen to come in contact with. So thou shalt highly value anyone you come in contact with as much as you do yourself. Now, that is real, top-level Christian living at the highest apex. Now, we're just giving you the same commandment. Now, the old commandment, is the word which he heard from beginning. 
It's the word you heard from the beginning, from way back in Old Testament times under the law. But now again, a new commandment I write to you. Now I'm giving a new commandment now. Which thing is true in him and in you? Because the darkness is past. Is past is a present tense verb. The darkness is passing and the true light now or already shineth. The darkness is passing and the true light is shining. Now notice in the next few statements he makes it clear that he's talking about loving others as a child of God, especially one another as believers. That is highly valuing, not disdaining, not putting down others at all. Now he that saith, uh, a present participle, he who is saying uh, are claiming uh, to be in the light. Uh, he is is an infinitive. So he that is claiming to be in the light, you're claiming you're in the light of the truth of the word of God and hating. The word hateth is a present participle and he is hating his brother or the brother of him. Now, if you're claiming to be living in the light of the Word of God, and you have hatred for another brother in Christ, what does he say about it? He is in darkness even until now. He's in darkness. He doesn't understand the light of the truth of God. God so loved us that he gave himself. How much do we love and highly value others? The word love, God so loved the world. He so agape, highly valued the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ so highly valued the world of mankind that he freely gave of himself. Now, a person who is hating the brother is in darkness even up to the present time. But he that is loving his neighbor, he who is highly valuing his neighbor, abideth in the light. Now, are we in the light of the truth of the word of God or are we in the darkness of the ways of the world because we are rejecting that? We think someone who is a brother in Christ is someone that's to be disdained and put down and we have hatred toward them. Then he says, you're obviously not in the light of the truth of the word of God. And there is, so, but it's, he says, he that loveth his brother, uh, he that loveth, his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him or literally rendered there is no cause of offense in him he who is loving his brother has no cause of offense in him but he who is hating his brother is in darkness until the present time so we're to love our brother as ourself thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself that is the royal law of scripture now verse 11 but he that hateth his brother, he that is a present participle, he who is hating his brother, uh, is in darkness, and walketh or orders his behavior in darkness. So one who hates a brother in Christ is in darkness, and he's ordering his behavior and living in darkness, away from the truth of God, and knoweth not whither he goeth. He doesn't know about these things. He is following the ways of darkness rather than light. Why? Because that darkness hath blinded his eyes or the eyes of him. We can rationalize and justify ourselves in all kinds of things. And we can claim to be living a good, clean, good, moral Christian life all the way through. But yet, if we have hatred for others, then God says you're really in darkness and you're, you're blinded in your eyes about it through your own self-deception in these matters and you are not really in the light of the truth of the word of God. Now notice he says, we've seen it, we've handled it, and we know it, that life which is eternal that we make known unto you and we make it that our joy can be real full because of our joint participation with one another. But we can only have this joint participation with one another if we highly value one another and we highly value God and we order our behavior according to the truth of the word of God and then 
we can have real joy constantly and have a delight and pleasure in each one. This is our obligation and responsibility before God and before our fellow man. No wonder, no wonder Christianity is in great disdain in the eyes of many people today. People have no respect for it because they don't see much difference in the life of the believers and those who claim to know Christ and be church members than they do in the rest of the world. Brethren, we need to order our behavior according to the truth of the teachings of the Word of God. That is our responsibility and obligation. We must spend time in the Word studying, analyzing, digesting the Word, and making it a part of our very being.